Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knapp. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. So this is a big shout out to uh, an old buddy of mine, Ken, uh, who's a big fan of this movie. So uh, Ken, this one's for you. Today's episode, we're talking about The Friends of Eddie Coyle. 1973, directed by Peter Yates, starring the one, the only, Robert Mitchum. Now, we know Robert Mitchum from a million movies, so we're just going to rattle off a couple. Uh, the, the first one that comes to mind, without question, uh, is in Out of the Past. Out of the Past, yeah. one of the great film noirs. Oh, my God. It's one of the best. Absolutely. Thunder Road. Uh, I, I learned recently that he wrote the original story to that. Not the script, but he wrote the original story for that. And then uh, Crossfire, another early noir. Yes, terrific stuff. And he was in, of course, Night of the Hunter. Yeah, he really, uh, in the 40s, he was he was coming up, but in the 50s, he really kind of hit his mark. Max Cady. Cape Fear. Plays Cape Fear. Cape Fear. He is so good in that, man. You know, I, I, I know the remake, and, and De Niro's very good, and he's maybe in some cases more menacing, but Mitchum only has to just raise an eyebrow to scare the shit out of you. And then... Uh, Ryan's daughter. Yeah. David Lean. Yeah, the Lean one. Yeah. That's a, uh, it's, it's a really it's, good movie. Uh, he was also in The Last Tycoon, uh, right. the Ilya Kazan with, uh, with De Niro. Oh. And it was, it was also Teresa Russell's first movie. Ah, yeah. very nice. Yeah, she was just a kid. And then The Yakuza. The Yakuza, yeah. With uh, Richard Jordan, who's in this film. And uh, Farewell, My Lovely, the, the remake later on with uh, Charlotte Rampling. Right. Very just, long just, career. Just to say the least, but uh, yes. the great Robert Mitchum. So we'll step back and talk about P.D. Yates, the director. A great director. Uh, you know, he just has a, a wide variety of stuff that he's he's done over the years. Started out on TV doing The Saint. With uh, James Bond, I mean. Roger Moore. Roger Moore. Yeah, which actually, Roger Moore did The Saint when he was doing James Bond. So he's really, really it was yeah, simultaneous? Uh, well, no, I, no. I, I, when he when he was James Bond, he was he was really The Saint. Oh, yeah. I got you. <laughs> and he did some TV, but uh, Bullet was his first real big movie. Oh, hit. man. Steve Arino. Just great stuff. And, you know, of course, the chase scene. Right. Uh, I, I heard that, that Peter Yates was a, was a race car driver at one time. And, and I guess, you know, if you see some of his films, they have some really interesting chases. Certainly Bullet's one of the best. He did one movie before that, a British film called Robbery. But when they were looking for a director, yeah. Yeah, I heard about they that. did not think an Englishman could do an action film or like a car chase film. Uh, and of course he proved them wrong. Yeah. And such a great 60s kind of California feel But it's not it. what you think it's going to be. You have to watch it again and go, wow, yeah. this is very subtle in so many different ways. And, and, and of course, Steve McQueen is always terrific. And then he did uh, John and Mary with uh, Dustin Hoffman and Mia Farrow. Mm-hmm. Love story. Um, Murphy's War with Peter O'Toole. Really? Like, so, again, jumping from yeah. one genre to the other. Uh, the Hot Rock. Love it. One of my favorite heist movies, and it's hilarious. William Goldman. William Goldman. Script. I was just going to say, yeah. Yeah. I always forget about that. Yeah. Uh, for Pete's sake, with Barbara Streisand, which once again we jump, you know, to another yeah. level of of directing, which you think, wait, how, how does this guy do this? And of course, Mother Jugs and Speed. <laughs> Mother Jugs and Speed. And just what, the title alone. And I just say, what? Well, it's got Rocco Welch in it. There you go. Is she Mother? She she must be <laughs> Jugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Typecasting. And then out of nowhere, Breaking Away. Such a great little Breaking character Away. Yeah, movie. it's such a small, independent type film, right? Yeah. The Deep with Jacqueline Bissett. God bless her in the t-shirt. That was a Peter Benchley movie. Peter Benchley. Written movie. And uh, The Dresser. The which, Dresser's great. With yeah. Finney and, and Tom Courtney. It's really, once again, a small film about these two men. Yeah. That's terrific. And their relationship. Yeah. And he just also did Suspect uh, with Cher and uh, Dennis Quaid. Oh, Cher yeah. does a pretty good role for Cher. Yeah, that was yeah. like one of her early roles. Yeah. And then screenplay by Paul Monash. Yeah. And this is from a novel by George Higgins called The Friends of Eddie Coyle. George Higgins basically invented the Boston crime novel. The dialogue yeah. is so snappy. Yeah. <laughs> it's so dead on. It's beautiful. But Paul Monash, he's been around a long time. Um, he started in, like, in the 50s doing General Electric Theater and Studio 57, Craft Theater, Playhouse 90. I love Schlitz, this one. Schlitz Playhouse. I was just going to say, I love it. <laughs> Schlitz Playhouse. Pretty funny. He, he did The Untouchables, Peyton Place, Judge for the Defense. Uh, and then he went on to do some TV movies, Salem's Lot, Stalin. He did a great 
version, his screenplay was a great version. It's Richard Thomas and Ernest Borgnine in All Quiet on the Western Front. I don't know if you've oh, ever seen it. I, it's really good. And then uh, let's go on to cinematographer, Victor J. Klemper. Holy cow. This, this guy, guy do a lot of work. Well, man. we've mentioned other cinematographers who've kind of done a lot of movies that we've loved. Right. He's done so many great films that early we're Cas- fans early, of. Early Casavetes. Husbands. Husbands. Wow. Right? They and might be giants with George C. Scott, John Woodward. The Hospital with George C. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, he, he really is a who's who of, of 70s movies. The Candidate. Another interesting movie did just before this, which is pretty good. I just saw it, Seamus, with Burt Reynolds. I never saw it. Takes place in Brooklyn. Okay. Very similar in look to this, like on the street. He's got a lot of different styles, but he's really good at realism. Absolutely. You know, street locations. Well, think about the grittiness of the way the gambler looks, you yeah, know? Right. I mean, that 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 looks so gritty. And and then he does something like the hospital, which, you know, I, I guess mostly it's, you know, the hospital lighting because most yeah, of it yeah. takes place in the hospital. But, yeah. Uh, Dog Day Afternoon. Dog Day Afternoon, Sidney Lumet. That is such a great movie that's so iconic. It's fantastic. Um, and, and it looks great. Looks great on the street, New York City, yeah. Brooklyn, yeah. amazing. And uh, and then another funny movie, Slapshot. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the, the guy did, it seemed like he, he, he did almost every movie of the 70s. Right. He did Coma. So Coma is interesting because that's like a whole different type of movie. It's like a horror film yeah. in a way. Or yeah. like a, yeah, no, it, it is. is. Sure. And it's really creepy, that movie. It just looks great. Yeah. And Justice for All. And he did Xanadu with uh, Olivia Newton-John. And we can't forget Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Oh, he did that. I did not know that. <laughs> I, 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 I missed that one. How do you go from uh, Eddie Coyle to Pee-wee's Big Adventure? And an- another another Cassavetes with Peter Falk, but he didn't direct it. It's Elaine May, Mikey, and Nicky. Mikey and Nicky. <laughs> All right, moving on. So the music, Dave Grusin. Uh, Dave Grusin has been around a long, 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 long so time. So he's originally a, is he a jazz musician originally? Yes. And, 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 and he did a lot of television. Uh, the Wild Wild West, I uh, did The Ghost of Mrs. Muir. He, he did the theme to, um, uh, to It Takes a Thief. Oh. That's yeah, a great theme song. And we can't forget, he, I know he did some music to Gidget. Gidget, of course. <laughs> Sally Field. Uh, he did, he did Maud and Good Times. The yeah. name of the game. Remember the name of the game? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it did that Did that as well. Um, and then some good movies. The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight. Right. The Yakuza, we mentioned. The Front with Woody Allen. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and just one last thing, I just because uh, I, I wanted to mention this. He did the original Beretta thing. Wow. Yeah, but, but this, before Sammy Davis Jr. actually did the lyric part, the right. singing part, he did the music, the, you know, the Eye on the Sparrow song. Wow. Yeah. And so more cast members, because uh, it's it's a really good cast. Oh, it's uh, loaded. Peter Boyle as Dylan. <laughs> Peter Boyle's the best. Yeah. You know, he just, this guy comes off as so authentic in anything he does. Uh, you know, he goes from Joe. A really interesting movie. Very 60s yeah, feel. Yeah, a really mean, racist guy. Kind of the original Archie Bunker, right. but meaner. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he, and he, and he uh, from that, he did The Candidate. The Candidate with Robert Redford. Totally different character. Right. You know, a wise guy is just going to get <laughs> this guy elected. It's great. Um, Steel Yard Blues. Uh, taxi driver. He's the wizard. And of course, young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein. Well, this is it. He bounces all over the place. He could do all kinds of stuff. He did Fist with S- Sylvester Stallone. Yep. He uh, did Hardcore with Hardcore, George C. Scott. George C. Scott. Yeah. Hammett. Remember that? Yeah, That's yeah, yeah, Coppola absolutely. movie. Absolutely. He did Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, John. Not the Poseidon Adventure, but beyond the Poseidon Adventure. Wow, he went beyond what? the... Yeah. <laughs> what, what the heck were they doing? I mean, Irwin Allen couldn't make enough money, I guess. <laughs> is it the same boat? I don't think yeah, I saw well, Beyond. Gosh, it is the same boat, Jeff. It is. I swear to God. So they're I'm still a, in the boat? I have no idea. They're in the other side of the boat. I have not seen that movie, but I just... I know that Peter right. Boyle's in it. Gene Hackman and gang were in the back of the boat. Yeah. They're in the front of the boat. Yeah, Gene Hackman is the priest. <laughs> Uh, and then there's uh, Richard Jordan as uh, the cop in this, Dave Foley. Yeah, he plays a real good prick, doesn't he, John? <laughs> yeah, yeah, real, yeah. And he's done a lot of stuff, TV he's a, stuff. He's, he's in a, Naked City, right. Ben Casey, a lot of early TV. And an interesting uh, Burt Lancaster movie, uh, Valdez is Coming. He was also in The Yakuza. Right, he's like the young disciple, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Logan's Run. Logan's Run. He was uh, in, in Woody Allen's Interiors. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, there's Alex Rocco. <laughs> He's great. The first thing that comes to mind when I see Alex Rocco is uh, The Godfather. Mo Green. Mo Green and yeah. The Godfather. Everyone knows him from Mo Green. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have um, Stephen Keats. 
I believe this is his first movie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, he was actually in All My Children in 1970. He was in Death Wish, The Gambler, Black Sunday. He was in the TV show Toma. He's a really interesting young actor. I mean, he yeah. has that face. And, He's got uh, a great face. Yeah. And then finally, Joe Santos. Once again, you know, the, the classic Italian-looking guy could be, a, could be a gangster, could be a police officer. Right. And, and he be- def- definitely played both. Okay. Off we go. Uh, I just want to begin us talking about the movie w- with this promo line, which I think kind of sums it up. Right. It's a grubby, violent, dangerous world, but it's the only world they know, and they're the only friends Eddie has. Yeah. I think that says a lot about this movie. I, I love the first shot. It's, it's shot through the, uh, the branches of a tree, and you, you're thinking, well, why would you set up a shot like this? And then the, there's a guy, he comes out of the door, middle-aged-looking guy, uh, blonde hair, uh, very 70s kind of sideburns and stuff, and then he goes into his garage and uh, he, gets, he gets into his Mercedes Benz and he backs out. Yeah. And as he backs out, we pan over and then we see a guy sitting in the car watching him through the branches. That's why we have the perspective we do. He's taking notes. That's right. And it's, that's Alex Rocco. That's Alex Rocco. But what's interesting about that opening scene is it's so picturesque suburban. It's like oh, fall absolutely. leaves. Yeah. You got the nice fancy house and the Mercedes, as you mentioned. I, you know, I, I grew up in a neighborhood like that, John. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a nice yeah, suburban neighborhood, so it's it's very familiar to me. Yeah. Which which makes the, the movie even more interesting of things that unfold as right. time goes on. And then it cuts right away to, uh, he's driving in, which clearly Boston, it's in South Shore, Boston, which is a neighborhood, and because he pulls up and it's the, the South, South Shore, Shore Bank. Bank yeah. yeah. He's Mr. Partridge, and the reason we know he's Mr. Partridge, no, no, not from the Partridge family, but he's Mr. Partridge because- No bus. He, no bus. He pulls up in his car, and we see on, on the uh, the parking space right. Mr. Partridge. So we gather he's the he's bank like president. He's like an executive at the yeah. bank, yeah. Right. And then you see Joe Santos in a car. So clearly, they're doing these guys are doing some kind of stakeout. You bet. So you know something's up. And then- Right at that moment, I'm pretty sure we get this jazzy guitar soundtrack going. Dave Grusin. Very 70s. Very 70s. But I really love the soundtrack. Yeah. So Alex Rocco gets up uh, out of his car, and he, and he has his trench coat on and a hat, and he, he walks into the bank. And I, I love this because he, he, he goes up and asks the teller, uh, can I have change of 10? Now, think about that in today's days, John. You know, <laughs> Ten dollars, yeah. give, give me change. You can't do that in a million years unless you have a bank account. <laughs> Obviously, they're doing again, as we said, they're staking out the bank in some way. But we did see. I just have to mention, just prior the armored car pull up, and you see the guys come in with cash. Right. Uh, and you know it's the '70s too, because the guy has button chops holding the shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> so Alex Rago's case in the bank. He means yeah. he's eyeballing where the cameras are and how the whole setup yep. is behind there. And then he basically just leaves. Yeah. He's and got- that's it. And again, this movie has a lot of scenes where you kind of get little bits of information and you're putting this story together. Well, that's it. And they and don't spill it all that's, at once. That's exactly right. And this script is really well constructed. It's yeah. very tight. This is not a movie to watch if you just want to you know, sit down and doze in and out. This is not a movie you want to f- fold your wash or something or you know, uh, uh, be on the phone. you got to pay attention to this movie. But if you, if you pay attention to it, it all comes together in a beautiful jigsaw puzzle. And then we cut to, we see Robert Mitchum. At the diner. And what's really amazing to me about Mitchum in this movie is and you t- can tell from the first shot. Right. This is not the Mitchum we know. No. This is not the straight-backed, tough guy who's got all the confidence in the world. Yep. This is a beat-up, world-weary guy. Right. He's like every man. Yeah. You know, he's just like this guy. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was a shock to see him this <clears throat> way, because that's that's not the Mitchum we all know. So And he, he comes into yeah. this very cool, old-school cafeteria. And he gets in line. I love the sign on the wall. Please don't line up. Step in at any section of the service area. It's yeah. kind of like a bar, cafeteria. It's like the old places on Ninth Avenue, John, yeah. right? You, know? you just you go get a piece of tables. corned beef and potatoes <laughs> and cabbage. Right. Keep it moving. So, so Mitchum comes in and he sits down. Yeah. And he's facing the camera. He's facing, the, he's on the right hand side. He's facing the camera. Right. And there's a young guy to the left of him, long hair, 70s mm-hmm. kid. That's, that's Stephen Keats. And we just see his back. And um, Mitchum's eating a piece of custard pie. And this guy starts talking. And he says, I can get you pieces by tomorrow night. I, I, I can get you probably six pieces. I got more now, but I 
promised someone the slot. Eddie is not happy about this. No. Eddie does not want other guns from somebody else's lot because right. he doesn't want them traced back. That's the whole yeah. problem here that Eddie's worried about. And the young guy says, it's, you know, it's, it's all right. <laughs> and Mitchum says, all right, nothing. Nothing. And, and that sets up right here and now how Mitchum really feels about this situation. And he wants this thing to go the way he wants to go. Right. And that's it. And because there's a reason for that. Uh, right. And he tells him. He explains how he becomes Eddie Fingers. Yeah. That he made this mistake years ago. And the guns got traced back to a guy. And he went to jail. And because of this, they took Eddie's hand and put it in a drawer and kicked it shut. And I love how Mitchum says it. He goes, hurt like a bastard. And what he says is, what really hurts is they put your hand in there and you know it's coming. You can't do anything about it. <laughs> That's what really hurts. I, I, I love the analogy he gives yeah. with his Catholic school teacher slash nun. Back when I was a kid, the nun would come over and and whack my knuckles right, right. with a with a steel um, oh, yeah. a steel, steel ruler. ruler. And and you know my wife went to Catholic school, so I know uh, about all this stuff. My brothers went to Catholic okay. school. Okay, you you lucked out, John. Yeah, I'm going to strike fear in both of my brothers. Yeah. Sister Mary Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> so so he said that the the nun would whack his knuckles, and yeah. he said after a few more times of this, she said, "Put out your knuckles," and he said, "No." <laughs> And, and so she ends up smacking him in the face with the ruler. And he said, it's the same thing. Right. So I don't want this to happen again. Yeah. I got four extra knuckles on this hand that I shouldn't have, and I don't want to have this happen again. Clearly, you, can, you know, Eddie's buying these for somebody. Right. He's, he's kind of the delivery guy. Yeah. This is like his job. And he's taking it very seriously. And he's talking to this young guy he's never met. Yeah. And so he's being very cautious. Yeah. Wouldn't um, you be? Yeah. <laughs> I'd be too. By the way, Stephen Keats' character, Jackie Brown. Yeah. The funny thing is, I know his <laughs> character's name is Jackie Brown. Never once do they mention the guy's name. And then we go to, to a, over to a, a bar, uh, an old man's bar, John. Industrial blue-green walls, fluorescent lighting. The big wooden bar with the, the soft cornered rims, yep. you know? And it's hazy as all get out because of the smoke. Yeah. So we get introduced to uh, to two principal players here, uh, Artie Van and uh, and Dylan. He's the bartender. Dylan, played by Peter Boyle. Dylan tells Artie that Eddie's looking for him. And Artie makes a call from the bar to Eddie. Quick call. And then he comes back and sits down. I love the phone is in the back room with the it's like this old one bulb room yeah. with the the cases of beer yeah, yeah, etc and that's yeah. that's exactly what those places look like so. yeah. yeah and then we cut to uh one of my favorite elements of the movie it's this empty quarry and this big long boat of a lime green charger <laughs> and, and there's jackie the the gun guy with, with his with his yellow shades yep. it's all very 70s he drives through this quarry and he sees this car with some great of, great funky music <clears throat> oh, i mean yeah. you would you would have thought quincy jones did this soundtrack <laughs> and there in the car is jack kehoe yeah he, another character I, I always remember him from the sting he's the one who gets his nose yeah. smashed and the pope of greenwich village What's interesting about the scene for me is you can see Keo's like he's bitching about the money he's getting. It's not enough. And Jackie's like, I know what you're spending the money on. And yeah. this guy's clearly an addict. As long as you can function, it's okay with me. But, but if you screw me up, I'm going to fix your ass. But what's interesting to me about this and the rest of the movie is these are small time players in a way. Like Jack Keo, the... They're not all making a ton of money. No. Some people are, but clearly not Eddie and not this guy. No, it's hand them out to say the least. They got to yeah. keep. They got to keep the the jobs coming. <laughs> and he gets the guns. They're in a paper bag. They're in a shopping bag, John. <laughs> they're in a shopping bag, and on the shopping bag it says the Garden of Eaton. <laughs> it's it's a real it's a real real you know old lady kind of shopping bag from from a supermarket or something. And what's what's neat about this is. The way the shot is done is you see our boy Jackie Brown walk past and the camera pans over to the bag and then we cut to this dark alleyway where Mitchum comes up in a car and he gets out of the car. And the way it's lit, as he gets out of the car, you see the bag. 
Ah, same bag. And then they wa- he walks over to another car that's parked. Yeah. And he lays it down, and it's lit once again. It's beautifully lit. Yeah. But what's really neat is 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 the bag gets put down, and you see exactly what's going on here. That bag is going to go in this trunk. Right. That he takes the key from, opens the trunk. He takes the, this is an old 70s magnetic thing. He takes key. the key from behind the license plate. Right. That's where, Which was in some old cars, that's where the gas, gas. filler was. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just love the way it's lit because yeah. the shopping bag's in, in on the left-hand side of the frame, yep. and you can see what it is, so we know exactly what Mitchum is doing there in the first place. Right. He bought these exact same guns, because right. they're in the bag, from this guy. From uh, Jackie, brings it, puts it in the trunk. Right. Eddie goes into Dylan's bar. Right. To, he walks right up to the bar. He, but behind him, right. you see Artie Van right. in a booth. And Artie Van gets up. He just goes gets outside. up, goes out right to the car, right. grabs the guns. Takes the guns. Yeah. Just very workmanlike. It's like they do this every day. And what I really love about this cinematographer is, and, and the way the movie is shot, these night scenes are night scenes. Yeah. And when right. when Mitchum walks out of this car, I mean, there's a little light when he comes out of the car, but basically when Mitchum walks into the dark, he's gone. He's it's, vanished. Yeah. It's black. And that's what things look like. I really hate when they light these scenes with yeah. big spotlights yeah. down the street and you see, the, like, who does that? Who sees well, Later in the 70s, maybe it was because of competing with television or whatnot, maybe. they used to light the shit out of everything. Yeah. So you could walk here, walk there. It didn't make any difference. They didn't have to do different, different setups. But right. this cinematography is beautiful. But interesting, Eddie uh, explains to Dylan, and we this is where we kind of learned some of Eddie's story, right. that he's looking at a sentence coming up. He lost this appeal. He's, he's again, you get little bits and pieces of information. He's going away for three to five years. We don't know why, but he know, we know it's... It's connected to Dylan right. because Dylan had him do some kind of a job. And Eddie says, you know, I wish I never did that. And Peter Boyle goes, I wish it never happened. But he's got no sympathy. He's like, you told me you needed the dough. You got the money up front. Right. You know what? You wanted a job. I gave you a job. You got caught. And then we cut to... Daylight, broad daylight, and right. there's Dylan. He's coming out of the subway, he's walking across the street, and it's this big kind of courthouse square. So kind of common, yeah. And there he meets Richard Jordan, uh, uh, Dave Foley, the cop. He's a plainclothes detective. Yeah. And Leather jacket. Yeah. You wouldn't know he's a detective. He looks like just some young guy. And Dylan is talking, he knows there's something going on, but no one's telling him anything. You can tell he's a cop because he's breaking his balls. He's saying, you know, you guys, you know... Uh, Every three weeks or so, there's a, there's a, some sort of grand jury going on, and all you guys just go underground. You all just kind of disappear. You should uh, have unemployment. And Peter Boyle gets pissed off at this because yeah. he's like, you know, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, funny enough, he just gives him a twenty dollar bill. Yeah, yeah. The guy hands him the twenty and says, "Have a nice day." <laughs> fully, fully is such a prick. <laughs> yeah, and just walks off. Yeah. So then we cut to the same suburban street we saw earlier. Right. And inside the house, we see Mr. Partridge. Coming down the stairs, yeah. he's dressed, clearly ready for work. Ready for work, and and, and he, he's walking down the stairs, and he sees his family in the dining room, and, and the through kids, the doorway. Yeah, the kids are the kids are sitting there, the wife is sitting there, and the cereal boxes are out. It's breakfast time. They're kind of just sitting They're there. They're frozen. It's a weird it's scene. It's very creepy. The They're, wife looks very dazed. Yeah. They're, they look frozen, and automatically, see, I just got the chills on the <laughs> back of my neck because, and he suspects something. This There's yeah. something wrong here. He steps into the dining room, and we we do a reverse cut, and you see on either side of the door are these guys. And the one lead guy says, Mr. Partridge. But what's weird about these guys is their outfit. The masks. They got these clear masks. They're clear. So what they do is they kind of take your face, and, yeah. they, and they morph it. Got the dark eyebrows, the mustache. Yeah. And, and to, honestly, John, it, it kind of looks sort of like a, a Burt Reynolds mask. You know? <laughs> right, because right, right, the dark right, right, mustache, right. dark eyebrows, but they look really weird. It's and really Alex spooky. Rocco is, you know, you have that Alex Rocco kind of uh, bass type voice, yeah, scratchy kind of bass voice, and and he's coming, he's talking through this little slit in the mouth, so it's extra creepy. It's but they have these like it's like a horror movie, but they're all like identical black hats, green overalls, yeah, uh, and these again these masks. It's like it's almost like a Devo kind of thing. It's weird, yeah, but it's creepy. Um, <laughs> So Scalise says, we're going to your bank, you and I and my friend. And what I like about this is I, I, I like a stick-up man with good grammar. Yeah. You and I and my friend. <laughs> but he's polite. He's very polite. My other friend will stay here with your wife and children to make sure nothing happens to them. Oh, that's good. 
And what's kind of poignant is the banker, he kind of walks up to each of the kids and he gives them a kiss. Yeah. Again, the wife is just looking dazed. Yeah. He kisses her and it's like, you do what these men want. All they want is the money. And Scalise is like, he's right. All we want is the money. We don't get any kicks from hurting people. But if you don't do what we want, at least one of them will be shot. Understand? Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, imagine that, John. You wake, up, you wake up in the morning, you're going about your business, and you've got three guys with guns holding your family hostage. It's and, and you have no choice but Nothing. to follow along. Absolutely not. I mean, the guy seems polite. You think, well, if I do this... This all will go okay, and you just can only hope. But the th- but the thing I, I mentioned before, you know, I grew up in the suburbs in in this kind of a you know. I, this happened to you? <laughs> no, but I grew up in this kind of a neighborhood. And the thing that's really creepy is these look like the safest neighborhoods in the world. Right, you couldn't be touched in a neighborhood like this. And what's also creepy and is a theme throughout the whole movie is this stuff happens in the light of day. Yeah, broad daylight. Yep, the birds are singing outside. There is no insulation. Right. Right. So they get him outside. They they cover his head. They make a big deal of right. putting this black wrap around his head. And they have him sit in the back of the car. On, on the, floor. the floor. Yeah. Here's a nice detail. They get in the car once he's masked, and they take off their masks. Right. Because obviously, if they're driving in the car, they don't want anybody to no, see these masked be, men. Be a little obvious. Um, yeah. Um, so this guy, he's really got no options. Uh, he's got to follow through. And they have him go inside to tell these people in the bank what's happening. To behave. To behave and open the back door. Do everything you got to do. Oh, and they also tell him he's got one minute to open the back door. So he, he starts a stopwatch. So they got this guy pretty much wrapped up, and he's got to do what they say. Right. Uh, there's, he's got no, no time to do anything else. So we're waiting for the safe to open. And Scalise, Alex Rocco, says to uh, the bank president, he goes, what time's that vault open? Because it's, yeah. it's a time lock. It's a time lock. And, he's, and he says, uh, 8.48. So we're waiting. And we're waiting. And finally, Scalise gets pissed off because he's looking at his watch. You can see him looking at his watch. He yeah. goes, when the fuck does this thing open? And yeah. you think he's going to blow everybody away in the bank. And luckily, like a little beat more, click, and the light goes on, yeah. and now they can open the bank. That two minutes lasts five minutes. You know what I mean? It's like when you're waiting. <laughs> you bet. You, it's just it's time an eternity. Just slows it's down. It's an eternity. But there's one shot I do have to mention. Guys. So everyone's sitting on the floor, and right. there's a one shot. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the Great Train robbery. One of the robbers in mask, he's looking at the people on the floor, and he just points his gun right at them. Right. Just in, like right at camera practice. It almost feels like slow motion, John. Yeah. You know? And it, it's just really dramatic. And you think, what exactly is this guy doing? Is he going to shoot them? Because it felt like he was going to shoot them. It's basically don't make a move. Don't make yeah. a fucking move without saying a word about it. So they get the money and they go They go into the car and uh, they, they take off. And they, they take the bank president with them. They, they put the hood on him and whatnot. And they drive to some area. I don't know if it's the bay or something. It's kind of Boston Bay or yeah. something. Yeah, the so, harbor. So they get, Feels he, like you're across the harbor from Boston. So you see the bay in the background and they tell this guy, okay, get out of the car. And just walk for it, count to 100. Yeah. And then you'll be all right. And the guy's walking, he's tripping on stuff, and he's- It's he, like garbage you think he's gonna, bottles. You, you think he's going to fall in into the, the bay, bay because- That's what I thought. He's walking right towards the water. And, I, and I'm counting to myself going, how far is he going to count? Is he going to fall <laughs> in there? He only made it to 30, John. He only made it to 30. So he's a pretty brave guy to take that hood off. I, I think I would have gone to 100, sat down, or looked yeah. over. You see them in the car, and they're watching him walk off. Right. He's walking, he's walking, he cuts, he gets a 30, he takes the mask off, right. and you cut back to a wide shot, and the car's gone. Everything's gone. So it's, yeah. it, it's if he they just dropped him from the air alone. or something, yeah. I mean, in a way, you got to look at these guys. It's very professional. Absolutely. This thing was like Nobody got planned hurt. to the T. Nobody got hurt. Yeah. So they, these guys are professionals. And then we cut to uh, basically the home life uh, with Eddie Fingers. Which, in contrast to the upper middle class suburban neighborhood, right. this is kind of like the working class. Absolutely. It's just like a big contrast, right? You think Eddie's this gangster, but here he is. He's a family man. He's a family man. And Blue collar like, family man. The way it's gets, it gets set up, which I think is beautiful, is Mitchum, this big bear of a guy, yeah. he picks up the garbage can on his shoulder, this beat up old you know, tin garbage the can. Old st- galvanized. Galvanized. The old galvanized. The old galvanized. The old galvanized steel. The old galvanized steel ones. And he puts it on his shoulder and he walks there. It's all beat up. He walks over and then clunk, puts it down and holds the garbage from falling out and then basically gives his daughter a kiss goodbye. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's 
you know, that's family man, blue collar guy. Yeah. And he goes inside and it's an old galley style kitchen, no cabinets. Right. It's got like a little industrial sink. It's great detail. Like just the way these houses look. That's exactly what it would look like. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an old fashioned kitchen. There's Absolutely. no fancy nope. things to it at all. And the other shocking thing, once again, too, <laughs> we're so used to Robert Mitchum. Yeah. Having the babe on his arm. Right. You know, Rita Hayworth. Right. Jane Russell. Yeah. And and here it is, this short, kind of chubby, average looking housewife. Yeah. Helena Carroll is the actress. And it was a shock to me because I, I just thought, well, wait, that's not the kind of woman Mitchum's supposed to be with. Well, you know, he's middle, right. The character's middle aged. This is a middle aged wife. This is what the couple would yeah. look like. Absolutely. And I have to say, it's a testament to his acting that at this point in the movie, you forget you're looking at Robert. Mitchum. Absolutely. He is just some kind of Joe Blow from South Boston. And I love how he walks up to his wife at this point and just gives her this big amorous embrace and then starts kissing her. And he's he's kind of getting worked up in it. Yeah. And, whatnot. And, and she says to him, Eddie, it's morning, which cracked me <laughs> up, you know. But, you know, I, I guess, you know, love has no time of day for Eddie Fingers. And then we cut to a meeting in this park area with Eddie. And uh, lo and behold, it's uh, Dave Foley. It's Dave Foley again. Yeah. So Dave is uh, working the the, uh, the neighborhood here. Well, that's how detectives work. They I have guess. like stool pigeons all over and people talking to them. And it's like gathering information. But it was know? interesting. Just a few scenes ago, it was Peter Boyle. And now a few more scenes later, it's now it's, it's Eddie. Surprisingly, Fink. it's Eddie. Yeah. yeah. He's trying to get Foley to assist him. And he says, look, I, I, I've helped you out before so i need you to help me out and, and basically foley's not buying and he said you know you did a couple of things right but they were not that big a deal i mean you know you told me about a robbery that was going to happen it happened 15 minutes later right you told me about some guys going to get hit and the guy got hit before we could even get there so you know you're not really doing much for me and what's interesting about this is 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 mitchum's body language yeah he is slumped he does not have that back straight shouldered thing. He's right. slumped. He's defeated. His hands just hang at his sides. No, Foley's the guy in charge. Yeah. And and Eddie then spills, well, I know about some machine guns. He's trying to draw Foley into helping him. And then we learn basically the reason Eddie needs his help is he was running liquor across state lines for right. Dylan. He right. got caught. So he's facing a federal charge in New Hampshire. Right. It's not something Foley can really do. I, I guess, you know- He look, can put a call in, maybe. Put a call in, but I, Foley's not exactly breaking his back to do something for it. Yeah, you don't see Foley reaching over the aisle here. He's just kind of stringing Eddie along. But Eddie's telling him, look, it's 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 embarrassing, you know, to my kids if I go to jail. You know, I don't want to embarrass my kids. And yeah. this is really hurting him. And you feel- terrible for Eddie. Yeah. Even though Eddie's a petty criminal, he just looks so pathetic. And he mentions helping uncle. Uncle being? Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. It's a federal charge. And, you know, obviously these guys are local criminals. In now, Boston. if you're going to help uncle, we see what we can do about this. Yeah, yeah exactly. But you're going to have to do a lot more work for uncle. And what's interesting with the movie, it's just a whole bunch of people and they're all trying to work some kind of deal the double crossing each other it's just such double a great... crossing left and right yeah it's... no honor among thieves there's no honor this isn't like <laughs> these godfather type movies where everyone's like you know got this code there's no code no it's amazing <laughs> it's amazing so foley says if you can deliver on this machine gun thing he'll put a a good word in for him right. uh, with the u.s attorney yeah uh, but if he doesn't deliver he says, all bets are off. And so right. Eddie knows at this point, if he doesn't get something really working here, he's going to jail. Right. So we see Jackie Brown pull up in his car again. Yeah. Uh, and he's by the Charles River. He, he goes, sits on a bench. Behind him is this old beat up panel truck. There was a guy in my neighborhood who had a truck just like that. The window was a little bigger. He sold candy out of it. It's like a little food truck kind of thing. Right. But it didn't look like an ice cream truck because you'd have that window where you'd... There, there was a tiny one. This little tiny window there. What, was, <laughs> what the hell kind of window is that? And, and you hear this voice coming out of the, the window. Hey, you. Hey, man. You, you selling, selling something? something? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and Jackie's like looking around right. like, what the hell? Yeah, because he's a hip guy. He knows yeah. he knows what's going on. And this dopey kid, this long blonde haired dopey kid comes over. Uh, you selling anything? And Jackie goes, maybe. 
depends. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to like, oh, yeah, I'm the guy with the gun. Yeah. Who the hell are you, you big, right. you big dopey kid? So the kid runs back to the truck, and he's talking to someone, and this woman, this young woman comes Girl. out. They're kind of like college students. I guess. And she comes walking over, and he's like, who the hell is this? No. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> he can tell he's not happy with these two people. But like, I, but I, but I like I like what the blonde guy says. This is Andrea, and he says I don't give a fuck who it is. <laughs> so she says we want to buy machine gun, and Jackie looks at her like, Are you kidding me? He said, Look, you want to go burn your fucking bra, all right? But what you gonna do with a machine gun? And, and she like, says we're gonna rob a fucking bank. And you go, yeah. What the heck is this? This young girl. Well, I'll just give you a reference for this. Yeah. So back in the 60s and 70s, the Weatherman was a group. They did all these robberies, and they were, they were kind of anti-government. Yeah. And there was a robbery in Boston in 1970. They actually killed a cop during a bank robbery. They were robbing banks to fund the revolution. So Jackie is like, look, I got two problems selling machine guns to people like you. The first is selling machine guns. That's life in this Yeah, life. State. So we know the stakes are pretty high. You got to be out of your mind to sell them. So then we cut to South Weymouth Bank, and we're inside the bank. Robbery in progress. Yes. And this time, uh, Alex Rocco or Scalise and his guys, they have different masks on now. And, and they're even creepier, I think, to some degree. They're rubber masks over the top. It's kind of like an old man yeah. mask, and they have ski caps over the top. I actually, I thought the other, I thought the clear mask was scary. It's funny you thought these are scary. I think they're both scary. I, I, I even think that the next set of masks they do for the next job, yeah. just the ski mask with the slits, which you don't even see people wear anymore. Right. I, I think those are scary too. Maybe I'm easily scared. I don't know, but you get these three creepy guys with guns. That's why you're not masks. a bank robber. That's probably why. Yeah. Uh, um, so kept, this is in progress. Can't be honest. And what's funny is the scene begins. This young, pretty girl is knocking on the door. She's an employee. Yeah. And this 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 manager, young bank manager, lets her in. We see things are going on. Right. And we hear another bank manager kind of go through the same spiel. I've done this before. This is the fourth time in 40 years I've been, been robbed. Just listen to what these guys have to say. I have my family at home. They're in danger. Right. Please don't be a hero. He's like That's just being stupid. Uh, so they're doing the robbery, and of course, of course, the young manager. Always one guy who one has guy. to do it. It's just yeah. it's just like airport, John. Yeah. You know, the, the guy the guy in airport <laughs> who goes, before the guy goes to the bathroom, grab him, he's got a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Always one guy. Um, so you see the bank manager with his finger on the alarm button under the desk. And the guy goes, what did you do? <laughs> and he shoots him. Of course. You know, why Why press that button? I don't understand. For what purpose? And next we go, again, to another great little Boston location. We see this charger pull into this big parking lot, and it's like this supermarket. And here's old domestic dad, Eddie, right. walking down the lot aisle with a cart full of groceries. Right. Great, great detail. It's got the Wonder Bread in the bag. Pulls up to the, to the car, and he's like, put the guns in the bags, put the bags in the cart. That's all he says. Jackie opens the trunk. So Eddie's Just had- take the bread out, put the guns in. <laughs> so he's got bags of bread for the guns. And then, he's, and then he's like, what about these other bags? He goes, those are my groceries. He goes, your wife make you do the shopping? Look, if I have to explain married life to you- <laughs> You wouldn't believe me anyway. <laughs> you wouldn't believe me anyway, right. <laughs> As he's getting these guns put in by uh, Jackie, he sees in the trunk the machine the guns. The machine guns. So Jackie, Jackie says, Sorry. you want to see when he goes, I don't even want to look at it. Yo, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to look at it. Yeah. I don't want to be anywhere near it. That is life in this state. Exactly. Just, so, <laughs> so Jackie drives away and he takes the guns. And no sooner does Jackie drive away, he goes directly to the phone booth and, uh, and he calls Foley. Uh, which is funny. He calls up and he's like, is Foley there? Stop farting around. Put Foley on. <laughs> he says it with a nice little Boston accent. Fighting around. <laughs> Fighting. <laughs> and clearly, again, Eddie's just too old for prison. He doesn't He doesn't want to leave his family. I think it's a nice touch to have him just with that shopping cart and groceries. Absolutely. It's, it's beautiful. Then we cut to this suburban commuter train station. Jackie Brown, 
He pulls into the lot. He's waiting to deliver these machine guns. He's waiting for these revolutionaries in this panel truck to show up. Right. What's interesting to me about the scene is he's just sitting there. You see a car go by or this little pickup truck. It's like an old beat up landscaper's truck comes in, circles. And then as the truck goes by, we see in the truck is Foley right. and, and two other officers. Right. And then we start to see around the station these these agents kind of coming out of nowhere, getting out of cars. Getting in position. All getting in position. Some have rifles, some right. have shotguns. And then then the, the, the dopey kids in the van pull up. Yeah. And they start coming out. And Foley says, do you recognize right. either of them? And uh, the guy goes, they look harmless to me. And Foley says, they're after machine guns, remember? Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> they're, they're dopey kids, but dopey kids with machine guns and hands can uh, be pretty scary. So the kids walk up to Jackie and they're like, come on, let's do this. Right. And Jackie's like, uh-uh. And they're like, why? And he goes, I'm going to sit here. For two hours. For two hours. He's going to wait it out yeah. and make sure, because as you said, he's been eyeing everything. Right. So well, he's got he's, a lot to lose. He's extra cautious. Yeah. And the kids are like, well, fuck this. We'll come back. And they go, well, let's go get something to eat. And they go. They leave in the truck. So Jackie's just sitting there. And then the cops have a dilemma, right? It's like, what do we do? They were, they were thinking, should we have taken them then? But we yeah. have nothing on them. Really. They nothing. didn't do anything yet. They're just standing by the car. So he goes, all right, fine. Take them now. So yep. Foley has to make that call. Right. And so they start moving in. And it's a very quick chase scene, but it's really intense because yeah. the cars are moving all over the place. Well, I thought if you're first seeing this movie you're going, oh, goody, goody, PDH, here comes a car chase. <laughs> 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 and he just, he sees them. Jackie sees them and he just tears out. Yeah. It's like. And I thought they were going to have some long car chase, but it's very quick, but it's pretty damn intense because it's yeah. boom, 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 boom. He's smash. only got only so much the, we can the, go. The, the lot's pretty full. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So they capture him, obviously. Um, and he says, you knew. You knew. You knew. Um, that bastard. I'll take care of that myself. Yeah. So we cut to Eddie and Foley in this little diner. Yeah. So Eddie Eddie wants to find out, um, you know, how it went with the, the busting with, of, of busting Jackie, Jackie with, the, yeah. with the machine guns. And uh, is Foley going to see that uh, Eddie stays out of jail as a payment uh, for helping out uncle, in essence? Now, Eddie's so nervous, and Mitchum plays this beautifully. He's so nervous that when the waitress comes up and gives him the coffee, he just flinches, yeah. like almost out of his seat, like, yeah. what the hell was that? Because he's so focused in on, come on, come on, come on, please, right. just do this for me. Come on, I did what I had to do for you. Please, please, please do this. So Eddie says, so that does it, right? And Foley goes, does what? Yeah. Now, you know right then and there that that's it. This guy's not going to do jack for him. Well, it's interesting. Foley says, look, I made the call. That I did my job. But if you don't like what it got you, you know, I can't help you. But he's saying the guy, meaning the prosecutor in New Hampshire, the federal guy, he's a hard ass. And he wants yeah, more. This guy's a mean guy, he says. Yeah. But basically, you're doing a nice little start. Yeah. But, you know, you're going to have to show you've turned over a new leaf. You're going to do more things. And Eddie's saying, you want me to be a rat. Yeah. You want me to be a rat now for the rest of my a life. permanent fink. Permanent fink. Exactly <laughs> right. And You feel guy, bad for him. And Foley just looks at him like, you know, you decide what you want to do. You make a decision you want to do that, that's yep. up to you. You don't want to do that, that's also up to you. And Eddie gets really mad and he goes, I should have known better than to trust a cop. My own goddamn mother could have told me that. And Foley says, everybody should listen to his mother. And he gets up and walks away. What a prick. So the next next thing is we see the four robbers again. They're in a car. They get to this house, another suburban house. Right. They got the masks. Right. This time they're different. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the old type of ski masks you had in the 70s where they had almost like these slits for eyes and a slit for mouth. Weird look. They looked weird. And they sneak into this house and you think the same thing's going to happen. And you hear the couple coming downstairs. Right. They're waiting in the kitchen. And next and thing you know- They're basically licking their chops. Yeah. And next thing you know, Foley pops out. He's got a gun. They and with all these other cops, and they get the April drop on fool, him. motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. They're caught. Yeah, um, they're toast. And then we meet Eddie and Eddie and Foley at a bar. At a bar, right? Yeah. And in th this scene to me is really heartbreaking because 
he thought before that that Eddie couldn't sink any lower, and and and, and he's so desperate right now. He's he's clinging at straws. Yeah, he's now willing to give up Scalise. Yes. To Eddie, this is like, this is it. This, this is, is going to get me out of here. This is his Trump card. And he's worried. He's like, I can't do no time. Um, these guys, they've got friends, and I wouldn't live to get out. So he knows. He goes to prison. He's a goner. So he wants this witness protection program kind of thing. Yeah. You know, he's, he's talking about going to Arizona or something. So he's got this whole kind of scenario in his mind, and he says, okay, you know, I, 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 you, you want a Scalise? I can give you a Scalise. Yeah. So Foley says, I guess you haven't seen the paper. <laughs> oh. And you know, because we've, we've seen, you know, uh, in the movie that they already yeah. got these guys. And this is the big Trump card, the coup de gras uh, that he's going to have. So disappointing. And it's heartbreaking. Foley says to, to Eddie, it's, it's too late. Yeah. You know, we already got these guys. He just would have come to me, you know, last night. Yeah. Then I, I I could do something for yeah. you, but now I got nothing for you. And he's got you know that's it. Yeah, he's toast. He's got nowhere to go. So suddenly Dylan is at this train station and he meets this guy. He's kind of like the mysterious man in this black kind of. He's the only guy in the whole movie that looks like a mafioso. <laughs> I just have to say he's got the black suit, the hat, Borsellino hat, right? He's uh, he's actually the the actor James Tolkien who uh, who played uh, the principal in Back to the Future, ah, the okay. bald guy, right? The thing is, they feel that it's Eddie Fingers, and the man wants him to, to get Eddie Fingers. He's now contracting Dylan as a hitman to do the job, and the man, quote unquote, wants it done now, tonight. And, you know, I, 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 I love this scene because Boyle's really good in doing these, like, he does these combinations of things, and you never quite know where he's coming from because you can tell he's really tense, yeah. And nervous about this situation. But at the same time, he's pushing this guy back. He's really kind of getting in his face and say, look, you want this thing done. That's fine. Yeah. But I don't do it that way. And I know the man wants something and he's asked me to do things for him before. We never had any problems. Right. I don't want any problems. This is the way you do things. Well, it's like he's such an opportunist. He's like, he's now he's going to make money killing poor Eddie. Right. You know, he's now the hit man. Right. Uh, it's ter- what, a, what a douche. Yeah. Yeah, he's um, definitely a two-face for yeah. sure. No ifs or buts. So back at Dylan's bar. And this scene, this scene is the most heartbreaking scene for me in the movie because Eddie walks in and it, it, it's it's like he's, he's like he's Felix Unger, you know, with no place left to right. go. <laughs> he comes to his friend's bar. Yeah. And he just is, you know, going to come there and just talk to him. And, and you feel terrible because you know exactly what's going to happen. Well, he's looking for a little tea and sympathy, and and also, sadly, uh, or poignantly, I'll say, Eddie, he kind of feels bad for Scalise, because he's, he's kind of a friend of Scalise. Right. And he didn't give him up. No. He was going to give him up, but now he feels bad that he was given up. He walks into the bar, and he sits down, and he gives a hand signal, and he gives like like a, a your your thumb and your and your pointer finger like a, like about, about two inches up. Yeah. And then he takes his hand, and he spreads his fingers a little wider, which means he wants a shot in a beer. Yeah. Which is an old man's yeah, signal, yeah, yeah. which I thought was great. So Dylan walks up to him, brings him the beer and the shot, and he goes, "So you making any money?" And he says, "Not exactly. If you want to ask me, I'd uh, have to tell you, I'm not having a very good day." <laughs> <laughs> really? That's that's the understatement of the century. <laughs> so as a consolation prize, Dylan offers to take him to the uh, the Bruins game, Boston Bruins. Right. Playing the Blackhawks. Right. Like, we'll have some dinner. You know he's just setting him up, but let's, you know, that me, makes, come back John, tonight. that makes it even worse. And, yeah. the, and the thing is, too, you know, Dylan is waxing philosophically about Jimmy Scal and, and Artie Van. And saying, you know, you win some, you lose some. They made about a quarter of a million dollars last month. You know, then the fuzz get mad. And then, then they, they kill those two, two guys, right? And, and Eddie goes, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to know who set them up. And Peter Boyle stands there and just goes, <laughs> yeah, I bet they would too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I read this scene took three days to shoot, actually. Really? Yeah. Uh, so they must have been to three different games, but it's very authentic feeling. Oh, my God. Absolutely. We're at the Garden. Uh, the Bruins are playing the Blackhawks. Real people in the stands, obviously. I don't know how. They must have just sectioned off this little couple of rows or yeah. something. Because 
there's all these great cuts of faces. But they capture. I mean, yeah. he captures faces in, in such mm-hmm. a great way. And Eddie shows up. Well, they're, they're both sitting there. and, and, and So uh, Dylan and Eddie are sitting watching the game. And he says, you know, my uh, my nephew, uh, you know, remember I, that guy gave me the tickets? You know, my, my nephew's going to be coming too. Yeah. He's, he's late. Eddie's like, I'm going to get some beers. Right. He gets up and goes. Uh, and then the nephew shows up. Yeah. So, so the kid's like, uh, what are you doing here? We're going to do it here? And, and, and Dylan's like, he'll never suspect we're in front of all these people. Yeah. Like what? And, and poor old Billy Loam and Eddie comes back with beers, Three he's beers. carrying beers, gets to the crowd, you know, makes his way in. You can tell he's in the bag. He's in the, he spilled some, yeah. you know, he sits down. Uh, they're watching the game and there's some great footage and Eddie calls out. Number four, Bobby Orr, <laughs> real Boston. I love that. I love because you really feel like he's there at the game. He he loves the game. Look at this kid. He's yeah. He, what a future this kid's gonna and have. And you him. hear the crowd roar. Right. You see them all excited. Right. Uh, and then there's a really sad line. He's like, Jesus, what a future this kid's got. Well, that's what I was just gonna say. Yeah, because you have no future. Oh, it's just- and, and and the thing that's really upsetting about the scene, and, and every time I watch it, I feel ill, because. It reminds me of, of, of the Hitchcock thing with the bomb. You show the bomb under the table yeah. while the two guys are talking, yep. and the bomb is under the table the whole time, Ticking and it's away. excruciating. Yes. And, and the scene seems like it takes forever. You're going, please, just get it over with. <laughs> but there's, there's, one, there's one thing. The crowd's going, going crazy. Well, a fight breaks out Yeah, on fight the breaks out on the ice, right? <laughs> and there are two girls with a powder blue eyeshadow on, and one of the girls goes... <laughs> Knock him out! <laughs> That's a hockey fan. <laughs> Unbelievable. So the game, you see them walking out of the arena. Right. Uh, cut. We're in the front. We're in the car. They're driving on the highway somewhere. And Eddie's in the front seat. Dylan's in the back seat. The kid is driving. And and, and Eddie's, Eddie is bad. He's wasted. Yeah. He's just like. And he's just kind of sloshing around. And he says, "Great game." Yeah. And then he falls asleep. He just falls I just asleep. got a lump in my throat because he's, um, he's actually palling around with these guys. Who's gonna? Who, the guy who's gonna kill him? Yeah, and so they discuss the plan while the poor guy's sleeping right, right there. He pulls the gun out. He puts it up to 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 Eddie's head. Bang. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Over. No and, warning, really. And, and, the kid's and, just like but driving. The, but the kid's reaction's unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. That was really loud. That's all he can say. Well, that was really loud. Well, that's the thing. Right? Guns are loud, and imagine being in a car and that thing going off. You know, like hell yeah. Yeah, but the guy's brains are just blown out. You know, <laughs> would you react to that? <laughs> wow, that was really loud. Yeah, that's why I used the twenty, <laughs> twenty two. He says, and the kid's like, "Is he dead? Yeah. <laughs> if he's not now, he's never gonna be." Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's shit. Good man. line. Sucks. So they pull up. And in front of this bowling alley where Eddie's car was, right. uh, I love the sign. It's 10 pin and candle pin bowling. Right. Now, candle pin, you only get in New England and Canada. It's well, like- the thinner pins or something? They're thinner pins and the ball, there's no holes. It's a smaller ball. You just palm it and Someone you roll it. Like, kind of like, like bocce or something, right? Almost, but yeah. in a bowling alley. Yeah. 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 Um, 10 pin is regular bowling. So yeah, beautiful location, great little neon sign. And there's a car. The kid- notices it's the same looking car and, and Dylan fucking guy's got everything he's such a douche and he's got everything planned to a T yeah it's the same cops are gonna be looking for this kind of car you drive me past the river I get rid of the gun yeah and we're done uh, and they drive off and then we cut to back to this freaking courthouse square location yeah it's Foley and it's Dylan where we first see them and when we saw them at the very beginning okay so so Foley Foley and Dylan are walking and Foley says to him you know uh, you gave us Scalise and we're grateful yeah you can't talk about Coil you can't talk about Coil it's all right it's all right well, I was trying to figure that out. It's like, is all he right. is his his uh, Dylan fed him a line that he doesn't really know, but he suspects. You know what I mean? Or does does Foley know Dylan killed Eddie? I don't think Foley knows Dylan killed no. Eddie. You know, the, the last line for um, Dylan is, you know, a man gets desperate. He does a few things. He knows it won't work. Pretty soon, he quits, packs it all in, goes away somewhere. That's the only way there is. And Foley says, have a nice day. 
And that's the end of it. And what's really chilling about it is Foley's a prick. And he doesn't really care about these human beings. They're, yeah. they're chump change to him. They're nothing. And Peter Boyle, uh, Dylan, is this guy who's so duplicitous that he would stab his friend in the back and then say, you know, is there an ambulance around? You know, yeah. it just, he just walks away. And this is such a 70s movie because it has that kind of theme where, you know, there is no justice. Well, what makes this a real depiction of crime is the bad guy wins. Poor Eddie is the schlub who's caught in the middle. He's he was never going to win. He was an easy mark. He says earlier on in the movie, you know, oh, you guys, they, they, they go to Florida. They make their money. They go to Florida. Like, I'm never going to get there, basically. Right. Poor Eddie. I mean, he's just a regular I'm still guy. I'm looking he's, for a way to pay the plumber. He's yeah. never going to make it, and yeah. he doesn't. And, and this, at the biggest asshole in the movie, walks away the hero. Because he was the smartest one. Yeah. Because he knew how to play both sides, and he knows that the mob's not going to take care of him. They're happy. They're happy that they- I mean, he, he sells everybody out, He basically. sells everybody out, but he did it in such a way that he walks away clean. Even Foley knows he ain't clean, but Foley says, okay, you did good things for me. That's fine. You got a Scalise, that's fine. There's a, there's a shot in the bar when Eddie's sitting there at the bar, and he looks at his hands, and he's got that extra set of knuckles, that busted yeah. up hand. And for me, that's Eddie right there. That's yeah. his whole life, this busted up knuckle guy who just can't get ahead. He can't get ahead. Meanwhile, Dylan is just- He's not. He's he's always getting his cash up front. Right. <laughs> that's the metaphor, right but there. But that's the difference. This guy was smart <laughs> enough to get the cash up front, et cetera. Eddie's not that smart. He's not. He's just not. So, you know, the script is so tightly constructed. Yeah. And as I said earlier on, if you don't pay attention, you're not going to be able to follow it because there are all these different pieces well, and they fit yeah. really nicely together. But you, you really, you really got to keep your eye on it. But if you, if you, if you do, and you pay attention, you have a beautiful payoff. Well, the great thing about it, it's not overwritten. You have to watch the movie. Everything happens in sequence. You're getting information as characters get it. Exactly. And it builds and it builds exactly. and it builds and the picture slowly comes together. And that's what makes it so much better is you, you're getting it as the story unfolds. Yeah. You're not getting little clues like, hey, wake up, you know. I mean, the only guy that here. knows everything is, is Dylan. Right. Everybody just... Your poor Eddie he doesn't see everything going on. Even the cop at the end doesn't know the whole story. I got a piece. Of, I got a piece of trivia for you. See if you can do it. All right. What beer is Dylan serving Eddie from the tap? Schlitz. Bingo! Very good, John. <laughs> Very good. Exactly. Yeah. Schlitz. I read something, and this is this really sums up what this movie's all about. It says one of the true treasures of the 1970s Hollywood filmmaking. A suspenseful crime drama in stark, unforgiving daylight. This is all happening in the light of day. And yeah. that's, for me, what makes it even more chilling. Because you're not safe in the light of day. Well, that's all the time we have this week. We'd like to thank our friend Glenn Arnowitz for his music. And of course our listeners for tuning in. So join us next week for another episode of Film Detour. If you like our show, please recommend us to your friends. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetour.libsyn.com to leave comments or email us with questions. That's filmdetour.libsyn.com. You can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can also find us on YouTube.